everybody knows that I've been ranting along about these 10 crisis points for a long time, but I think it's very good to just refresh our memories a bit. There's a legislative vacuum still, okay? We're narrowing that vacuum a little bit. <clears throat> what are we going to do about this plant counting nonsense? Ah! You know, Germany's allowing four plants. <laughs> Sorry. Who's going to go pl count the plants in Ponderland? Huh? Mm. Walk through a river up a hill, over another mountain, <laughs> through another river, whatever, and then you go to something like one, two, three in this field as far as the eye can see. Nah. I don't think so. But it's not, it is not solved yet, this plant counting nonsense. Okay? I don't think we're ever going to get no plant counting, if I had to read between the lines. But that plant counting threshold is super important. Ignorance of the history. I think the people who have come to this cannabis business in the last even 10 years are super ignorant about the fact that it's the last apartheid law. This was make, made by the Bura Bullets back there in 1908 when Jan Smuts went and wrote to the League of Nations and said, Oh, you're busy babbing opium. What about this Dacha stuff? You know, Egypt chimed in. And said, yes, what about bung and hash and all of that? And that's how cannabis was included in the International Drug Conventions and was made internationally illegal in 1925. So next year, we're going to have great fun celebrating the centenary of cannabis prohibition. It's 100 years next year since South Africa went and chimed in and got it banned internationally. And this ignorance of this, the, our government forget that it's the last apartheid law, but I think all of us will keep reminding them. <laughs> Cannabis issues is political suicide. Mm, it's quite a trendy issue at the moment, but it's still seen as political suicide by parties like the DA. We haven't said, since they're part of the government of national unity, we might have a chance of sitting down with them. We don't really know. I can't say on record what the DA think about weed, but as, as far as I know, the DA don't like weed, okay? They don't. Plus all of the other little, um, little parties. And certainly for the, in the election manifestos, the ANC, all they said about cannabis was that it's bad and it's addictive and it's a terrible scourge in our society, and that was a quote from the Department of Social Development, who have been conspicuously absent mm. since the trial of the plant when they're all protesting outside the court. Mm. Where's the Department of Social Development and their scourge of drugs? So this political suicide thing is still in abeyance. Drug education, this institution that we're in now. Ongoing arrests, which we're going to speak about now. <coughs> licenses and the Dacher Dompas, because that's what we call a license. Permits, sure. There's going to have to be regulations and we can't have a free for all. But when it comes to Dacher private clubs and growers and all the complicated things that happen on the grassroots level with cannabis, we're certainly not going to be advocating for licenses. There has to be associations and permits and, and whatever, whatever, but the word license is certainly a dirty word in our in our world. Now this one I know my dear colleague Wesley will agree with me, or will disagree with me, overselling the economic benefits while creating val barriers to entry for vulnerable communities. Now you've also heard me say very often that while the focus on the Ponderland farmers, what about the guys up in Limpopo? What about the rusters who grow weed on the, uh, in the islands in the middle of the Orange River in the Northern Cape? What about all of those young white males who were disenfranchised with the end of apartheid? Because yes, they did used to be privileged. And people were, you know, we've got to make progress in our country. What about all of those young white males who the only thing that they could do when they couldn't get a job was grow weed? You know, who fed their families too. So when we talk about vulnerable communities, we're not only looking for the photogenic people in Pondo land sitting outside their huts who make for good publicity for some European NGO. No, we've got lots and lots of vulnerable communities. What about the people in the township? Nobody ever talks about the people in the township who don't have a business anymore or get harassed by the police. 
who or who should be drawn into this Dachau Private Club's community of ours. Industrial cannabis. Ooh, aren't we hearing a lot about that now because it's legal? Because you remember, the Cannabis for Private Purposes Act only says the fruiting and flowering tops. Hemp is now legal. <coughs> We've never grown hemp here in the last 700 years. Are we going to use our land race? Are we going to import gazillions and millions of equipment to process this hemp from Europe? Uh, what are we going to do with this hemp thing? It is still a crisis point. It really is. And of course, the industry speaking in vacuum and silos which is, it's, it's getting better since the Pakisa last year. It really is. Um, we certainly at Fields of Green for All, we're starting to feel more and more heard. But the one thing that we do really know at Fields of Green for All is that we do have some solutions. We have stuff to put on the table. And there on the right-hand side is our two major forms of solutions. Going on special today after this meeting for only 200 rand each. You have cannabis in South Africa, the people's plant, a full spectrum manifesto for policy reform. And I can't tell you how many times during that Pakisa last year when we were sitting there with the government for five days. It was amazing, by the way, that ex experience. It was so amazing. I, I really super valuable and I really salute the office of the of the president for putting that together and Operation Volentlela and the Pakisa means hurry up, you know, make way, hurry up. It was, it was amazing. Okay, the findings haven't been made public. It doesn't matter. We had this amazing experience where we could put everything on the table, and during those five days, and the amount of stuff that we'd already written in the manifesto, which were published in 2021, we were, which were brought up as solutions, not introduced as solutions yet, but were brought up as solutions. And then Paul Michael was speaking about the bigger picture and the Canvas Embassy, we published this earlier this year. We're very proud it's just been translated into Japanese <laughs> because things are happening in, in Japan. Um, this particular toolkit is now in seven different languages. So we have English, French, Spanish, um, Czech, um, not sure other ones, but now most recently in Japanese. And this is a, the Sustainable Cannabis Policy Toolkit. Or you can say Sustainable Policy, policy Cannabis Toolkit. You can work it all around. But when it comes to the bigger picture and human rights, and certainly the Sustainable Development Goals, this is the toolkit to look at. Because out of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, there are 15 that can be helped, not sold, but helped. Now what's happened with the Sustainable Development Goals is that we've only got four, six years to go till 2030. And we were meant to have done all these development goals by then. Nobody's anywhere near. So what they're busy doing at the United Nations is they're devising something called an impact for the future, which will take the place of the Sustainable Development Goals. But this is certainly the place that cannabis fits in, within the bigger picture, and particularly when it comes to developing co uh, co countries and um, vulnerable communities, and particularly when it comes to protecting our environment. Those are obviously two of the things that we had front and center when we wrote this toolkit. And also thanks again to Shane, who did the layout and, and the designs and everything for this. Our dear Shane from Print of View. So that's the problems and the solutions. The thorn in the works. Always. Always, always, always. And you know, we first designed this little Stop the Cops logo long time ago. Long, long, long time ago. Probably 2014. When we still called our, our project the Join the Q project because people were joining us with these days of prosecution. So in order to realize why we've got to stop the cops and in order to bring this conversation right here into the room i have asked our dear friend ryan friedman where is he there you are <laughs> our dear friend ryan who spent a good 10 days locked up in a cage who went through hell was lucky to come out of sun city you know um, with his life, you know, with his dignity intact, 
I think it was something that he will never forget. But Ryan is going to, and Craig over here was his legal counsel, and yeah, I'm going to ask Ryan to come up and tell your story. Hello everyone. Um, wow. So what an honor it is to be here today. Thank you for organizing this, making this happen. And uh, thank you for, you know, making this gathering a meaningful success by the full audience that we have here. So who am I and why am I standing in front of you? So my name is Ryan Friedman and I'm here to share my experience and involvement and my vision with you because we're at a turning point in the cannabis industry in South Africa. That said, following the High Court ruling of Judge Dennis Davis in 2018, uh, where cannabis could be cultivated, used and exchanged lawfully as long as it was not being, oh, not being sold to the general public. I then became a founding partner and co-architect and for the case in point, manager of the Greenside for your local pharmacy and canaporium in uh, Glen Eagles Road in Greenside, Johannesburg. After Judge David's ruling and the Concord acknowledged and, and accepted this ruling, ultimately showing industry support. And now we have even more direction with the recent signing of the Cannabis Bill or Act. The Greenside implemented a method that only allowed uh, cons consenting adults who had been educated and fully understand the effects of cannabis use and become members after signing a contractual agreement. A member can select from a variety of products uh, from the club as well as make contributions. The system ensured that the offerings were only for members and not the general public. We implemented and strictly enforced various protocols throughout our stores and private club venues of which there are currently seven. The South African Police Service came past our premises on numerous occasions. Even, we even instructed our team members that if the police came to our premises, we should show them that our way of operating was legal and no criminal offence was being committed. And there should be no bribes or inducements offered to the police of any kind. Our team members complied with these guidelines on a number of occasions and continue to do so to this day. And we pride ourselves being known as a business that doesn't pay bribes to our, in our dealings with authorities, government departments <coughs> or law enforcement. Education of law enforcement is crucial in these matters. My case in point is that on the 6th of June 2023, almost five years after the green side opened, a contingent of police descended upon the Greenside store where they seized all the cannabis products of the club and proceeded to charge and arrest me. I was held in Norwood holding cells for the weekend taken to Hillbar Magistrates Court on the Monday where the investigating officer failed to show up and reminded me for custody for three more nights in Diplof Sun City Prison. I'm not a religious person but in a place where kindness um, is seen as a weakness and can get you stabbed or worse. I remembered who I was. I remembered the culture I was there to represent and so I was at very least I felt protected. And so justice followed my journey through the random acts of goodness and kindness towards us. In doing this my journey through the nightmare allowed me to survive. I was bailed out on Thursday morning just in the nick of time, I might add. After months of my case repeatedly being postponed, the charges were withdrawn and the club's cannabis products returned by order of the court. I saw this conclusion as a major, major success for myself, the green side and the industry in terms of the club model framework and all the pioneering achievements of Field of Green for All. So some may ask, why, you know, why go through the hassle and I could have just have paid the cops with a weekly envelope. So the answer is simple. When you pay a bribe today, it comes back tomorrow and the sound of corruption begins, which will always end badly for us. 
So some may ask, do I think the hassle of detention was worth it? All the time. I say that I say that the hassle was no hassle at all. Because we have achieved um, legality through the significant through the signing of the cannabis for private purposes bill, an act which gives stores that organize themselves properly as clubs like ours at the Greenside or any other legitimate club model for that matter, will be operating within the law of cannabis for private purposes. What a victory. A mandla. <laughs> so, so what's next? <clears throat> I very sternly believe the strong and powerful cannabis industry can be fostered in South Africa in accordance with the President's Sona address of 2022 and become a hundred billion industry in the next two years. There's no reason why the cannabis and hemp industries cannot flourish now that we have a legal environment to do it in. We should never pay the cost of bribery and corruption because then we perpetuate the cycle of corruption and become part of the problem. Part of the problem that many of these new cannabis dealers and over-the-counter tuck shops are feeding into. Places like these are opening their doors with increased frequency and they and they are a danger to the cannabis industry, my brothers and sisters. So, I call all stakeholders here, here's a framework that we have built and that can be used and followed. We will all need to comply and stop paying the cops now. Police harassment must end. Authorities need to be educated and illegal outlets need a harder foot on their necks. Let's form a solid, formidable gathering of, of, of spirits. Let's come together with balance and bravery. Together we can nurture the birth of an industry that could sustain millions of South Africans and hundreds of millions of Africans in the years to come. We at the Greenside are dedicated parts of Fields of Green's campaign and vision here today because we support all the courageous efforts to ensure compliance by clubs and to continue to advocate harm reduction through plant medicines. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. You know, we've got thousands and thousands of stories like that. Um, our dear Charles, who's down in Cape Town and he's on the Zoom. We've got a whole project management system for all of these busts. You know, this is just one very, very heartfelt story of somebody who had, uh, you know, quite a few nights in a very uh, scary place. But, you know, if it wasn't for all of our, as I call them, secret weapon lawyers. You know, Cullen and Associates and Schindler's, they might get all the glory. But over the years, we have certainly grown very close to our secret weapon lawyers. And those are the people who uh, get up in the middle of the night to go and rescue some poor stoner who's been arrested and is in some godforsaken police station and is on their way to some awful magistrate's court. And we've got a whole army of these lawyers across South Africa. Uh, but some of them have become, been with us for so long that they're very, very special. And I think that uh, Naveen Pele is possibly on, on the Zoom. Uh, he's been amazing in, um, in Cape Town and certainly somebody that we can phone any time of the day or night. Um, uh, and then today, thank goodness, we have three of our secret weapon lawyers here. And I'm going to ask them to come up and just speak about uh, of some of the work that they're doing and some of the experience that we have in the magistrate's court. Because what's happening is people are still being locked up in cages, okay? Usually for the weekend because the cops always come on a Thursday or a Friday so they can keep you there for the weekend. Except on Saturday, we had a really, really amazing experience. Well, not so amazing for the owners of the club in Cape Town. But the cops arrived unmarked car, unmarked cops not in uniform, wouldn't put, give their ID, no search warrant, nothing. They then took the, the owner of the club to the police station. They then wrote out a, a notice to appear in court, notice of summons it is called. And they let the guy go on a warning and said, okay, you've got to be in court on Monday or whenever it is. And that's the first time it's happened that they didn't lock him up in a cage. So we're busy trying to do some like background work to see 
How come those cops knew? I think it was maybe Durbanville. Uh, who was it? Langebaan. Langebaan cops have obviously read the police directive. Nobody else has. But that's the first time in 14 years that that poor guy wasn't locked up in a cage. And he will go to court. And he will be let off. I can tell you. Because 99.9% .9 of the cases of possession and dealing, they just get thrown out by the magistrates because the magistrates know. But I don't want to go carry on about this thing because, first of all, I would like to please introduce you to Craig Harvey, who's going to just tell you a, a little short thing of, of what he's been experiencing in the gutter courts, as we call them. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bradford, and Fields of Green for all for arranging this, and Myrtle for inviting me. There certainly seems to be a lot of confusion about the legal position regarding cannabis, not only for the public, the shop and club owners, but also the police and courts. This includes both the prosecutors and the magistrates. The criminal justice system for our purposes consists of the police and the criminal courts. Myrtle has asked me to comment on our, my experience in the magistrate's court. It is important to remember that we cannot really separate the police and the criminal courts as they work hand in hand. So I will also make reference to the police. If you get bust or <coughs> if you get bust for selling or dealing, under the current legislation, the Cannabis for Private Purposes Act, these may be the consequences. Arrest and all the results of this. There are people here who can discuss this with you. Well, Ryan has already done that. Um, but this can never be fun or something to be taken lightly. Being behind bars can be a situation which makes the mind realize all the bravado outside means nothing. Bribery may soon look like a good escape for many, as many at, any at Fields of Green, and I will tell you that is not a good option. This is your decision without our approval. Everyone on this team will assist you to the best of our abilities, but we will never be involved with corruption or collusion with the police. Two, any stock and equipment seized by the police will in all probability never be recovered. And the stock may end up at the clubs who have the police on their payroll. An exception to this was um, a case I had in Hillbrow Magistrates Court, which Ryan has clearly and thankfully <laughs> told you about, um, where the stock seized from a club in Greenside was returned after successful representations to the prosecutor for a stay of prosecution. At other jurisdictions, these same representations for a stay of prosecutions are refused, and I was told that my client should approach the High Court for a stay. This points to the fact that there is still no consistency in how the law is applied. This client may have managed to get his stock back, but he spent nights in the holding cells and at the police uh, uh, um, and Johannesburg prison, and as he told you, this is Sun City, and I can guarantee you, the you know, only gambling you do there is for your life. Three, all the costs that you have lost, or all the costs that you have had to incur are lost, unless you put in a claim against the police. And this can take years to resolve. We are ever refining this process, and we will deal with these matters to put continual pressure on the minister and uh, Commissioner of Police. I'm currently involved with Simon Delaney in claiming from the Commissioner of Police in a matter which I dealt with in the Rustenburg Magistrates Court. This matter went to trial and the accused was found not guilty. But the trial, um, but the trial only occurred after nearly 11 months of postponements and delays by the state. Not only was this client held in custody, but he also lost all his stock and equipment, which the police said had, had been destroyed be before the re resolution of the trial. He and his wife suffered major pain and suffering. Any payment from a possible police claim in your favor can never get back the stress and loss of time to you and your family. Mm -hmm. Four, 
You may be lucky enough to have your case thrown out at the first appearance, as prosecutors may do this depending on the severity of the case. If the prosecution decides to proceed with your case, which will probably happen if you have large amounts or there's uh, proof of dealing, the court process may drag on, causing stress to everyone involved and costing you further money and time on a matter which could still go to trial. These cases can be delayed by further investigation to the police and waiting for forensic reports. All of this means delays, more court dates and expenses to you. Once the case is ready for trial, the prosecutor will make the case against you with any witnesses they have, which is usually the police. I was involved in a trial earlier this year where a farmer was busted with one kilogram of dacha and 900 plants. He was charged with dealing. When it came to the judgment in the matter, the magistrate asked for written heads of argument to be provided, and this is unusual in the magistrate's court. This may indicate that the magistrates themselves are unclear about the law about cannabis. This client was found not guilty based on the heads I submitted, but that may not always be the outcome with large quantities. Um, and five, be aware that arrests are still happening for small amounts of cannabis, like 300 grams being transported. This may well be more than 100 grams, an amount still to be set by the minister, but it's but it is, uh, still seems a harsh thing to charge somebody like this for dealing. I had a case like this in Pretoria recently and the police were extremely unhelpful to say the least and they abused their power. And my client had to spend three nights in the, in the holding cells at the police station only to have his case withdrawn on the Monday by the prosecutor at the first hearing. This client had previously been arrested for a grow in his house and that case was dragged on for, for six months until I got the magistrate to strike it off the roll. This shows that once you have had the police raid, once you are on the police radar, tread extra lightly or move. <laughs> what the law is currently, the Cannabis for Private Purposes Act has been signed by the president, but has yet to be gazetted. But Milwaukee, yes, has it been gazetted? Okay. Mm. The regulations have still to be made by the minister, so we are, the amounts contemplated are still presumed to be those in the bills. Two, it is imperative that you are aware of exactly what you're allowed to possess, grow and transport. So I think let's pick up the banner, so proudly carried by Julian Stopes, and stop the cops. They must be aware that we will sue them if they abuse their powers in any way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Craig. And it's so nice to have Craig on our team because him and I go back long way, long before the Dacha couple even. And now it's just, it's great. And um, another person who does incredibly hard work in the Gata courts and who is known to a lot of you, uh, who also just going to share something briefly about his experiences. I know that uh, Mr. Stefan Buzedinot, 420 attorney, as he is known, has just come from Kruger's Dup Dorp Court where he's representing that bus that happened in Michalisburg, that uh, Mildestrift, Michalisburg, Michalisburg, yes. Michalisburg, um, uh, just a few weeks ago. And Stefan has just come from, from the Gata Courts in Kruger's Dorp, our court, that's where Jules and I were, were charged and where I'm going to go back and get our thousand rand bail one day um, but i just thought you know it's good to have a perspective from the lower courts it's all very well having all of these highfalutin um things happening in constitutional court and high court and everything but the action is is in the lower court so uh stefan 420 attorney a few words thank you hi everyone thanks for for joining us today um Hashtag stop the cops. Um, so in, in 2013, um, the Dacher couple's 24-7 arrest victim support helpline was launched. Mm -hmm. This is called stop the cops. Um, and 
Yeah, they haven't had a day's rest since, I would say. <laughs> um, starting originally as hashtag join the queue, um, this was our helpline, and uh, Tyler's volunteers have helped uh, countless Dacha arrest victims over the years, learning, adapting, and networking with legal minds to best support anyone um, who's facing down our thugs in blue. So Charles Henning is, is the star of the show. Uh, he joined our team in 2014. Um, Charles is the facilitator, the manager, the organizer of this operation. Um, he took over the role as victim support manager from Joanne Perry, also a legend, and um, who is our long-standing audiovisual manager. Um, so Charles is the calm, collected voice carrying our victims through the trauma of having their homes raided, privacy violated, and personal property confiscated. Um, so helping victims 24-7 has also exposed Charles and our team to the harsher, more abhorrent realities of what ordinary decent people, not criminals, um, go through when they are thrown in cages for practicing their constitutional right to cultivate, possess, and use cannabis in private. From police brutality to sexual assault in cells, from merciless destruction of private property to murder, we have seen and, and heard it all. Charles is often the first respondent uh, to Dacha arrest victims and the best at doing what he can to get people the help that they so desperately need. Over the years, we have helped literally thousands of Dacha arrest victims with, with legal and psychosocial support. Um, so while we at Stop the Cops do not directly dispense legal advice, we do put you in touch with the best legal minds in cannabis to help you through the process of getting your stay of prosecution uh, or withdrawal of the charge altogether. We have accumulated swathes of experience and grown a truly formidable team of legal experts that can assist Dacha arrest victims around the country. Many of the incredible people we have helped over the years have become our staunchest supporters. So it is therefore imperative that you, all of us, must know our rights so that we can also stop the cops um, should any thugs in blue come, come knocking. Let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Simon. We, have a, we are cooking up a little thing that we've been doing for a while, and that is an interdict against the South African police services. But we're going to, you know, litigation is so expensive. Um, so we're going to try everything possible. We're not sure how we're going to do this because the police have their own training programs and they don't want some dachetani coming and interfering with their training programs. But somehow we have to try and compel the police to take that directive that we, it was so hard won at Pakisa, you know? Even after the Pakisa was finished, we still had to wait three weeks before that actual directive came out. We've got that directive now. Now, how do we get it out to the various police stations? How do we train the South African police services about Dacha? We don't know yet. And that's why we really, really appreciate uh, your support because there's all of these little things that are going on in the background that we don't necessarily shout about all the time, but it certainly does take the time of our, of our amazing legal minds to work out a strategy on how to put a, a stop to the cops.